Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is always amazing to see the turnout for these events because it tells us you love history, and that's why we are here as well. I'm Sherry Trotty, I'm president of the Historical Society, and this spring it has been such a pleasure to collaborate with the J. Robert Oppenheimer Memorial Committee to provide these speakers and this opportunity for us to learn. You know, the mission of the Historical Society is to preserve, to promote, and to communicate the amazing history of this community. And one of the ways that we do it is through lectures. We also have walking tours, and if you haven't had one, put it on your bucket list because they're great. And in those tours, our docents do all this research and they also talk to people in our community and they learn these little tidbits. And it just makes history so much more interesting. Um, one of the funny stories is during the Manhattan era, you did not have washing machines in any of the places that you lived. It was a community laundry. And if the tech area needed additional power, the lights were turned off, the electricity was turned off on town sites. So here you are with your family, you're trying to do your laundry, and then the power goes out and you are stuck. Nothing else to do. Um, one of the other ways that we will be telling more of the story, we have acquired the Oppenheimer house, and our 92-year-old beauty definitely needs a lot of work, but once everybody helps in contributing to that fund and preserving it. We have hope to tell not only the story of Robert Oppenheimer, his family, the people during that era, but people that have gone before and after. But that is a little bit down the road. And now at this time, I would like to introduce Tom Reeby, who is going to talk to you about the J. Robert Oppenheimer Memorial Committee. First, I need to remind everybody that the, the exits are over on the sides in the back, should we need to leave. My name is Tom Reby. I'm the chair of the J. Robert Oppenheimer Memorial Committee. And we are happy to co-sponsor tonight's presentation with the Los Alamos Historical Society. The J. Robert Oppenheimer Memorial Committee is celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. And unprecedented in our history, our volunteer members have done a flurry of work to celebrate our organization's history and our future. Uh, and I just ask that the current and past members of the Oppenheimer Committee stand up out there. All right. Thank you very much. Sorry to put you on the spot. The J. Robert Oppenheimer Memorial Committee was started in 1971 by Los Alamos people who were disturbed by the treatment that Dr. Oppenheimer received in Washington after the Manhattan Project. They wanted to honor the man who contributed greatly to the war effort and who was without question the father of Los Alamos. It's 79 years of science and economic contributions it's made to Los Alamos since then. And the Oppenheimer Committee is continuing our efforts to have his security clearance reinstated um, to this day with others. The J. Robert Oppenheimer Memorial Committee's mission is to promote the memory and spirit of Oppenheimer through our annual lectures, our scholarships, and our community activities. This year, in celebration of our 50th, we offered Los Alamos and our region a series of events. On, on March 21st, we co-sponsored a hybrid panel with the Parito Environmental Education Center entitled The Magic of the Parito Plateau. After all, it was the wonder of the Parito Plateau that drew Oppenheimer here in about 1928. On April 4th, we sponsored 
Los Alamos historian, Los Alamos National Laboratory historian Alan Carr, his talk, Manhattan, The View from Los Alamos of History's Most Secret Project, and I trust some of you were there. And uh, I urge all of you to visit our current ex exhibition on the second floor of the Mesa Public Library, honoring our committee's legacy. And the, the um, exhibit is entitled A Legacy of Learning, the 50th Anniversary of the J. Robert Oppenheimer Memorial Committee. The exhibit has some wonderful surprises that I think you'll enjoy, and it ends on April 24th, so hurry on over there. Over the decades, the Oppenheimer Committee has offered scholarships to outstanding Los Alamos High School seniors, Pewaukee High, Santa Fe High School, and Capitol High in Santa Fe. Um, to date, thanks to public donations and endowments, we have granted $668,000 in scholarships, many to students who will be the first in their families to attend college. Yay. We have sponsored 46 public lectures since 1972, and 16 of those were delivered by Nobel Prize laureates. And after missing two annual lectures because of the pandemic, we are happy to resume our annual lecture program this year on August 12th with world-renowned astronomer, astronomer, excuse me, and presidential science advisor, Dr. Farrell Azo, president, uh, professor of astronomy and physics at Arizona State University. Dr. Ozell is an amazing person whose career has taken her on some of the same paths that J. Robert Oppenheimer tread. She shares an interest in black holes, uh, among other things. Her talk promises to be one of the most fascinating we've ever offered, and we please hope you will attend in this room on August 12th. The Oppenheimer Committee plans to continue our public events and scholarships as we enter the next half century. We are committed to granting scholarships to students for years to come. All our work relies on your financial support. Please visit our website or talk to any of our members here about how you can donate. Tonight is the final event of our 50th anniversary celebration and we offer New Mexico's own James Kanetka, biographer of J. Robert Oppenheimer and Los Alamos historian. And here to introduce him is Los Alamos National Laboratory historian, Alan Carr. Good evening. Woohoo! I said good evening. Who's, who's excited about hearing Jim? So I brought, I brought a few notes to introduce my friend Jim Kanetka. Uh, I was telling Tom there, I mean, this could be worth a lot of money someday. So uh, Sherry, you may have won this for the Historical Society, just letting you know now. This is like the bureaucratic stuff that I want to make sure I get right uh, before I get into the more fun stuff. And so, uh, did you know, Jim Kanetka trivia, did you know that Jim's dad worked at our laboratory here in town uh, back in 1948? Those two. Okay, so keep that in mind. Keep that in mind because there's, there's more. Uh, actually, it was that same year that Sandia, maybe you didn't know this, but Sandia started out as one of our divisions, Z division. They needed to start from us, and so his dad was also an original part of the uh, Sandia team, we think, as well. So there, there you go. You have that. Now, Jim is actually a second generation Los Alamos National Laboratory affiliate of some kind, because you might not know this, but uh, uh, Jim was given a clearance many years ago. He worked at the laboratory back in the mid-1970s, back before historians were invented, I think. Uh, even, this is even before Roger Mead, for those of you who, who remember Roger, uh, who's doing quite well, actually. But, uh, but anyway, we had all of these old records that were completely or unorganized, nobody knew quite what to do with them. And uh, behold, Jim Kanetka showed up to save today, sorted through all of those old Manhattan Project records and saved them for us here. And uh, 
make my job possible, or at least a large part of it. So I'm very appreciative of that. And he didn't get paid. How about that? Huh? But did it, this is just the type of person that we have before us today. And Jim didn't get paid for it, but he did use those records to write one of his many books, City of Fire, you may remember that, maybe you remember General and the Genius. He did so well that the laboratory sent him to the National Archives to try and extract, which he did successfully, historical records there too. One of which he shared with me just this last week. And so Jim is, uh, he's been here, he knows the history. Not too many people have written on the Manhattan Project who had clearances and had full access to the record. So he has, so he's got that. Second generation, one of us. Uh, I should also mention as well that he is, um, I guess, you know, to make this a, a real introduction, not just all fun, fluffy stuff, but he's actually been employed by the University of Texas. Um, I know, I know. <laughs> he's good anyway. He's good. But anyway, he was the, I wrote this down, the Associate Vice uh, President of Development. Now, as you all know, all vice presidents exist to go and get money, and that's Jim's job, so UT right there. <laughs> Keeping us in last place at Texas Tech because he's raising money there at the University <laughs> of Texas. But uh, anyway, well done, Jim. And so I do want to mention last piece here, then a very, very quick story. Uh, author of six books. Did you know he's got six books? Hopefully, all of you who said no need to go to Amazon or your, since we don't have auto, where's the, are the, the historical society books, are we open? Let's sell some books, all right? So we'll go buy those. But uh, six books in the Jim Connecticut collection, three of them are fiction, three of them are nonfiction, including uh, City of Fire, which I mentioned before, and General and the Genius, a favorite of uh, many of ours. Uh, one of the more day was a New York Times bestseller. So be sure and check that out. Uh, and so I do want to close, holding on to my notes here. Uh, Jim showed up on my doorstep back about eight years ago I, uh, I didn't know Jim, and he uh, was, uh, we get requests from all over the world, get to meet some incredible people in my job. And uh, so Jim was, uh, I think it started out as a revision of City of Fire and then grew into General and the Genius. But uh, we've been good friends for many years now. Jim is genuinely one of my favorite people, uh, a trusted colleague, a dear friend, a friend of my family's, and a friend to this community. So he's from out of town. Okay, let's, let's let him know how pleased we are that he's here. Jim Kadekia. Thank you, Alan, for that kind and colorful introduction. I bought a used car from him yesterday. I think that's why he's saying these nice things. I have to tell you that although I grew up in Albuquerque uh, over the years living in Texas, I forgot two things about April in New Mexico, northern New Mexico, wind and allergies. And you can tell by my voice that I'm seriously affected by both of those. Um, I, seriously though, Alan, thank you. But the first thing I want to do tonight is to recognize the J. Robert Oppenheimer Memorial Committee. This is their 50th anniversary. Congratulations and thank you for the invitation to speak. And by the way, big congratulations to the Los Alamos High School robotics team. They are headed to Texas, let's hope they don't stay there, to attend the World Championship competition. So, go Hilltoppers. It is said that ordinary men die and turn to dust. But great men die, and some of them become legends. So tonight, I want to talk to you about Robert Oppenheimer, both the legend and the legacy. To do that, we have to first start with looking at how he's represented in popular history. And we start here because over the decades, books, motion pictures, television, and other dramatic uh, productions have increasingly interpreted the man in a rather narrow set of portrayals. Now, once we identify these, we will then compare or supplement this popular Oppenheimer with what we know of him from the historical record. In other words, how do these dramatic representations stack up against history? How can we tell a richer story? The goal is not to contradict or dismiss the public image, to enhance it, to balance it. And this is a particularly good moment to talk legends and legacies because 
not only are we celebrating the 50th anniversary of the committee, but this time next year, we will be treated to the man who has come out of the historical shadows because he will be the subject of a major, major motion picture. I hope the film succeeds, yeah, because if it does, if it engages viewers with some degree of accuracy, then our newer generations will discover something of this remarkable man and while he still merits our attention today. I also want to speak informally and, and briefly. Given who you are as an audience, I have to assume that you already know something about Robbenheimer, at least about his directorship of Los Alamos during the war. So forgive me in advance if I make references or I mention names that I don't explain because I have assumed you either know or you understand. My hope for myself tonight is that after four years of researching, interviewing, and writing about Los Alamos and Oppenheimer, I might have one or two things of value to share. And by the way, and this is most important, and I'm going to rely on the six people in the first row, if I begin to speak too fast, which I have a tendency to do, just wave your hand and I'll slow down. It's an irony, I think, that even Oppenheimer would find flattering, maybe not, but he's never quite left the public stage, even in the decades since his death. He reappears from time to time as a subject in movies, television, new biographies and books, documentaries, plays, and opera, and of course, histories of World War II and the atomic bomb. Uh, he's integral to three of my own books. And he survives while many of those associated with him are largely forgotten. When was the last time you saw or read or heard the name Leslie Groves, although he will be a character in the forthcoming film, or Gene Tatlock, or Henry Stimson, or Roger Robb, or George Marshall, or Hank on Chevalier, or even a man named Louis Strauss. All these individuals were significant players in Oppenheimer's life and therefore in shaping his reputation, and yet they are largely footnotes or relegated to small parts of chapters. Robert Oppenheimer survives and continues to intrigue us, fascinate us. Why? I think because he's mythic. And over the last 10 or 20 years, I've been collecting one word or short phrases, descriptions of Oppenheimer by biographers, by writers, by critics, and here are just a sample of them, but I think they all apply. He, is, he has the brilliant mind. He's the salesman, the sage, the actor, the tormented scientist with a soul, the gifted leader, the patriot, the victim of national hysteria, and above all, the flawed hero. He has, I think, endured as a public figure because his life has followed a tragic arc, a man gifted by the gods who rose too quickly and inevitably fell, a modern Icarus. And let's face it, we mortals love that kind of story. So, what, does the Oppenheimer, uh, what did Oppenheimer represent to people in the late 40s and early 50s? What they knew about him came primarily from newspapers and magazines. Today, most people know him as a character or a, maybe a secondary figure in, in movies and television. And they may not even be aware of how he played such an important role in the history of the last century. It would seem that for every solid, insightful biography or book about him, there's an actor out there portraying a caricature. These caricatures are the result of producers, directors, screenwriters, documentarians, and others reaching for a way to portray this very complicated man. And they do this by creating a narrative around a series of well-known and dramatic events, usually at the expense of the larger, more complicated individual. It's understandable. After all, you have 90 minutes or two hours or two hours and 30 minutes to tell a story in a film. But we never learn what led up to any given episode in his life, much less what followed. Let me give you three events in Oppenheimer's life, all of which occurred in the, la in the decade following the end of World War II. Each of these contributed to the way the public sees him even today 
they also reveal something about the man and his character. On October the 15th, 1945, famous event, just two months after the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Robert Oppenheimer and then the new Secretary of Defense, Robert Patterson, met, I'm sorry, Secretary of War, Robert Patterson, met privately with President Harry Truman. Oppenheimer particularly hoped to use the occasion to share his growing concern about the future of nuclear weapons and, of course, their ultimate control. Oddly, almost inexplicably, Oppenheimer's famous eloquence abandoned him. Wringing his hands and searching for words, he confessed, Mr. President, I feel like I have blood on my hands. Now, spoken to a man who had had to make many life and death decisions in his short presidency, it was not a welcome observation. According to one account of the meeting, Truman, hearing this, pulled out his handkerchief, handed it to Oppenheimer, and said, well, here, would you like to wipe your hands? Even not true, it makes a good story and it serves a point. Because after the meeting, and this was written down, Truman would say to an aide, blood on his hands, damn it, he doesn't have half the blood that I do. This episode may have been the first of Oppenheimer's public rejections of his wartime success. His bloody hands confession quickly made the rounds in Washington circles. Nine years later, on April the 13th, 1954, Americans living on the East Coast awoke to a banner headline spread over three columns in the New York Times in red. Dr. Oppenheimer suspended by AEC in security review. Scientist defends record. Hearing started. Access to secret data denied nuclear expert. Red ties alleged. Very shortly, Versions of this story with similar headlines appeared in newspapers all over the nation and became the flood of editorials and commentary on radio and television. The news came as a shock to the public. They knew nothing of Oppenheimer's political past, much less his controversial role within the AEC and the debates over the development of the H-bomb. For ordinary Americans, he was the man whose face they saw not just once but multiple times on the covers of Time and New and Life magazines. He was the epitome of the patriotic scientist. The press quickly took sides while the public found themselves struggling to understand what happened. Joseph and Stuart Alsop called the hearing a miscarriage of justice. Walter Rinchel disagreed, however, Several days before the news broke, he leaked in his column that a famous atomic scientist was in fact, here's the key part, an active Communist Party member. For those of you who are not familiar, and many of the younger ones may not even know of it, the 1944 hearing, it was a largely politically motivated administrative procedure within the Atomic Energy Commission, or the AC, supposedly held in secret to decide if Oppenheimer was a threat to national security. And if so, the AEC would be justified in refusing to renew his security clearance, which was about to expire. And I'll talk more about this event later. In 1965, less than two years before his death, in a special NBC television documentary on the decision to drop the atomic bomb and broadcast nationwide, Oppenheimer offered his somber reflection on viewing the first test of atomic bomb at Trinity in July 1945, holding his pipe. He said, quote, a few people laughed, a few people cried, most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I can't think, and I've tried to remember, if there's a documentary out there about Oppenheimer that doesn't contain that, quote, I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Whether he was grandstanding or not, and some of his colleagues believed he was, the message was dark. He seemed to suggest that scientists, 
including himself, had failed humanity. But more than just a few of the men who were with him that day in Trinity in 1945 remember Oppenheimer heading his, to his car to drive back to Los Alamos after the test, giddy and smiling and, as they said, swaying as if he were walking on air. At the time, his interview and his choice, I think, of this particular quote generated a negative response from friends and foes alike. Was Oppenheimer simply displaying his erudition, his friends asked? Or was this Oppenheimer, the actor, strutting his moment on the atomic stage? Or more cynically, was he pretending to an ethical stance that was false, asked his foes. For most of the public, he simply came across as a man consumed by some combination of guilt or regret or maybe even shame. These three events and many others help shape how America came to see Robert Oppenheimer in the months and years that followed his hearing. In his time, he may have been the first of what we would call today a media star with his own brand. He was the Carl Sagan or the Neil deGrasse Tyson of his day. Every speech he made, every appearance before a congressional committee, every interview he gave brought him publicity. And let's not forget that television was quickly supplanting the radio as a source of news. Partly as a result of this shift, Robbenheimer drew attention not just because of what he said and he did, but because he looked like what much of the public thought a genius should look. And even the bloody pop pork pie hat and the pipe and the, or the cigarette worked to promote that image. Voice? Voice. I think we were out of here. Are we back? Okay. So let me suggest to you what I think are the most common historical portrayals or perceptions. There are two. And tonight I'm going to call them. Oppenheimer the penitent, and Oppenheimer the victim slash hero. The first I briefly touched on before. You'll remember that the classic meaning of penitent is an individual who expresses regret or sorrow for something he did that was wrong. In this case, Oppenheimer the penitent was the man tormented by his role in developing the atomic bomb, and more often than not, someone who we're told primarily in films felt this unease from the very beginning of Los Alamos. It's not for us, but more particularly, it's not for me to judge the sincerity of his feelings. But it is important to understand that Oppenheimer's actual wartime role complicates such a simple story. For example, many of the men who worked with him at Los Alamos during the war, I should add women too, or during the war found this new post-war Oppenheimer disingenuous. And they felt this because, on the one hand, Oppie eagerly threw himself into the making of the bomb, fully aware of its destructive potential, and then, on the other, wrung his hands after its use. They also remember that he had enthusiastically recruited them to help make this new weapon. The second characterization, characterization is the victim hero. This is the story of the scientist attack and destroyed for having had the courage to disagree with or to oppose powerful political and military interests who believe that the H-bomb must be achieved immediately and at any cost. In this role, Oppenheimer spoke up both as a scientist and a human being to warn a world increasingly threatened by newer generations of terrible weapons. His hearing was largely a result of this perceived obstinacy. But the hearing was also based on the deep-rooted belief within some government circles that Oppenheimer posed a security, rat, a security risk to the nation. And there's some basis for this. The conviction first took hold in the early 1940s, even before the creation of Los Alamos. It was subsequently embraced by the leadership of the Atomic Energy Commission under Commissioner Louis Strauss, as well as by members of the military and Congress. It centered on the accusation that Oppenheimer's flirting with left-wing movements in the 1930s clouded his judgment during the rise of the Cold War. Many were further convinced that even if he was never a formal member of the American Communist Party, Oppenheimer nonetheless remained sympathetic to its cause and tried to assist the Soviet Union 
purposely by trying to halt or delay development of the, of the age bomb. Unfortunately, this is my grief, neither one of these broad storylines capture except incidentally what I think are among Oppenheimer's most important and lasting contributions. I, and you don't see these in films. I am talking about the Robert Oppenheimer who helped make America the leader in theoretical physics in the 1930s. I am talking about the unexpectedly talented man who joined the war, established and then successfully led an entirely new type of scientific and technical organization. I am talking about the scientist and public servant for over a decade who wisely counseled the government on the future of atomic energy. And not least, I am talking about the man whose organization he created even today survives on this mesa. Nowhere is the penitent Oppenheimer portrayed more consistently than in motion pictures and television. Let me give you a few examples. Perhaps the best known, most widely watched motion picture to date is 1989's Fat Man and Little Boy with Paul Newman as General Groves and Dwight Schultz as Abby. It's an ambitious but flawed film, largely, speaking now again as a historian, from almost the beginning, you're presented with an increasingly conflicted Oppenheimer, a man confronting the terrible nature of his work, who at one point in the film confesses to his wife, quote, Christ, I have rats in my head. The script also selectively edits history to support this portrayal. A critical sequence in the film in the movie is set in May 1945 at a meeting in Washington, D.C. to discuss the use of the new weapon. This was a real event. In the movie, however, Oppenheimer announces to the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, and other senior administration officials that the bomb could be demonstrated. True. But then, the script immediately changes subjects. In real history, at that actual meeting, Oppenheimer follows that comment about the demonstration and goes on to say that as leader of the scientific panel, he and the majority of colleagues have no choice but to recommend dropping the bomb on a city for the greatest possible effect. And beyond that, the film repeatedly and falsely suggests that opposition to the use of the bomb, or even the bomb itself, was early and widespread at Los Alamos. There's just no evidence for this. Oh, and by the way, this is my favorite part. There's a scene with Robert and Kitty Oppenheimer sitting in their living room talking. Spread out on a coffee table is a very large, detailed, schematic, stamped, top secret of the little boy gun bomb. That wins. But coming next year is a big budget motion picture written and directed by the talented director Christopher Nolan. I think it's titled Oppenheimer, at least at this point. Big name actors are involved. They've already shot footage here in Santa Fe. And most importantly and promising, I think, is that the screenplay is not based on, but at least draws from the fantastic biography of Oppenheimer, American Prometheus, the triumph and tragedy of J. Robert Oppenheimer by Kai Bird and the late Martin Sherman. I hope we will see a film worthy of the subject. Television portrayals are similarly flawed. One of the earliest to see was a production on television called Enola Gay, The Man, The, Mish, the Mission, and The A-Bomb. Robert Walton, an actor who portrayed the reporter of the TV series Lou Grant, was cast as Oppenheimer. Unfortunately, his portrayal was one of the earliest to introduce the hand-wringing scientist whose every utterance you know, predicted doom. One last example is a dramatic production called In the Matter of J. Robert Oppenheimer by German, are you ready, psychiatrist and playwright Heimar Kepard. His play was based on the AEC's, AEC's official transcript of the hearing. Oppenheimer was cast as a heroic but tra tragic victim of anti-communist hysteria. That, that'll, that'll work partly. The production was a huge success overseas and won multiple awards. Oppenheimer, who was alive when it, when it premiered, was given the script. He was appalled. He was appalled as he had his portrayal as a, as a scientist who felt guilty for making the bomb and particularly outraged at these lines in the closing monologue by the actor portraying him. 
quote, I began to wonder whether we were not perhaps traitors to the spirit of science. And then later, quote, we have been doing the work of the devil. Obviously, even Oppenheimer, I mean, even Europeans saw him as a tortured man. Now, let's, let me re-examine these two popular storylines and where we can, let's see what history has to add. I, I think we have to take Oppenheimer at his word and accept it when he says he experienced guilt or at least some form of regret after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That's fair. But one question we can ask is how these feelings match or stem from this earlier conduct. Here's what we know. Oppenheimer actively sought to involve himself in the growing fission movement in the early 1940s. The, create, the creation of the Manhattan Project and the appointment of General Leslie Grove raised the prospect of a special laboratory where all of the scattered research projects, mostly in universities, could be consolidated. Oppenheimer wanted to lead that laboratory. And as he told his wife Kitty, he was, quote, courting Groves like a lover to get the job. Fortunately for all of us, he got it. We also know that Oppenheimer threw himself into organizing, traveling, recruiting, and managing an organization that started with a handful of people and grew to 6,000 by the end of the war. His relationship with General Leslie Groves was one of the great partnerships of the Second World War, and even more astounding given the stark differences in their backgrounds and personalities. I kind of like this whisper. I think it adds drama, so we're going we're to go with it. I don't have any choice. Los Alamos uh, is an extraordinary achievement for someone who only a few years, at best, managed a handful of graduate students. And as far as we know, he was never heard to express doubts about working on a bomb. Although everybody who came here understood, who knew what was going on, that if successful, their, their efforts would result in a weapon that might end a terrible war and bring peace. That was the driving force. So why did he do it? Why did he push himself so hard that he was frequently on the edge of exhaustion if in fact he had qualms about the work itself? I think the most reasonable explanation is that he was a patriot. He was doing his part for the war. And it was necessary. Let's not forget that the prospect of a German atomic bomb was still very real in 1942 and 43. But I think he also, I believe, that Oppenheimer found his role as director exhilarating. I think nothing in his life before had ever challenged or engaged him so totally as directing, directing Los Alamos, and he was good at it. And after all, was not Los Alamos the perfect synthesis of his ambitions to somehow combine physics with New Mexico? We also know by the late spring of 1945, it was likely that several weapons would be available for use by summer. Despite any misgivings, Oppenheimer agreed to have laboratory staff join military planners in selecting targets in Japan. And in a meeting in his office and chaired by him, it was agreed and recommended that targets needed to be large urban centers no less than three miles in diameter and have great strategic value. There can be no doubt that Oppenheimer now understood that save an early end to the war, atomic bombs would be used. He also participated in the most crucial meetings held, meeting actually, held during the war regarding use of the bomb. And I briefly mentioned this earlier. In May of 1945, Secretary of War Henry Stimson convened the first of several high-level high meetings to consider not only the use of the bomb, but post-war implications. He called it the interim committee. And at the same time, he created a small scientific panel to serve as advisors. Oppenheimer was quickly invited to lead, and among other members of the panel were Laura, Ernest Lawrence and Enrico Fermi. At the committee's final meeting on May 31st, the scientific panel was invited to join the interim committee and participate along with General George Marshall, who is the Army Chief of Staff, and General Groves. During the meeting, Oppenheimer reported on the current state of weapons technology 
and development in Los Alamos and described what would likely be the next generation of weapons, including a fission device to ignite a more powerful fusion bomb. When discussion turned to the use of the bomb against Japan, a number of ideas were discussed, including the possibility of a demonstration. Oppenheimer spoke up and quickly reminded the committee that in the, in the panel's uh, re uh, recommendations, only the use of the bomb against a city would demonstrate its sheer destructive power. And if we wanted to bring the Japanese to the table to surrender, they needed to be impressed. He also recommended that the bomb be dropped without warning. Now, he posed the obvious question about demonstration. What if Japanese representatives were invited to watch a test on an island, let's say, and the bomb failed to detonate? Whatever his personal feelings, Oppenheimer was firm. If the bomb was to be used, it needed to be used against a large city. Clearly, he was involved in not just leading the effort to make a weapon, but in recommending its use. I am not raising these points to challenge his sincerity nor attack his reputation. He remains an extraordinary individual who served his country for over a decade and in the end paid heavily for his efforts. But it is important for us to understand that Oppenheimer's actions during this pivotal period were far more complicated, more controversial than movies or televisions have made him out to be. And what he did during the war explains what he did and did not do, or helps explain what he did not do after the war. I, I think you can understand why many of his laboratory colleagues found it difficult to understand what they saw as this radical change in attitude after the war. They remember Oppenheimer calling a meeting on August the 7th, 1945, to personally give a briefing on the successful bombing of Hiroshima the day before. They remember the man who walked down the aisle, hold, grinning and holding his hands clasped above his head like a prize fighter, was not the man later wringing his hands in public in guilt. As I said earlier, the more critical of his colleagues found his behavior disingenuous, his foes believed him to be hypocritical. Now let me revisit Oppenheimer, the victim hero. This is the man who was falsely charged by the AEC with left-wing and or communist activities and other indiscretions. And more grievously, he was charged with personally delaying or seeking to delay development of an advanced thermonuclear weapon despite the growing threat from the Soviet Union. And because of this, so the, so the story goes. His security clearance and therefore his access to atomic secrets should not, could not be renewed. These charges were weighed and judged in a supposedly secret, very soon public hearing. The popular image is that he was falsely found guilty but redeemed in the end for placing his humanity above national fear. Uh, fear, I don't know if you've heard that. He became the Oppenheimer who put himself in jeopardy by cautioning against an arms race at a time when anti-Soviet hysteria was growing, knowing that it would possibly cost him his career with the government. In the 1930s, Oppenheimer was never what they called at the time a fellow traveler, certainly wasn't, at least as far as we know, a registered member of the Communist Party. But what investigators continue to remember and to apply as part of their argument for not renewing his clearance were, among other things, his close relationships. Jean Tatlock, his girlfriend for several years in the 1930s and who committed suicide in 1943, you know, was a, was a member of the American Communist Party, as were his brother and sister-in-law, Frank and Jackie, and even his wife, Kitty. And then, there was what infamously has now become known as the Chevalier Affair. In 1943, just months serving as the new director of Los Alamos, Oppenheimer was approached by a close friend and fellow Berkeley faculty member, Hancon Chevalier, who offered to put him in touch with someone who could pass scientific information along to the Soviets. Oppenheimer rejected the offer out of hand, and eventually, he delayed, but eventually he reported it to Army security. Unfortunately, for reasons not even clear today, 
Oppenheimer elaborated on the story, and as he later confessed, he said he, quote, concocted a completely fabricated story. In any case, this behavior would haunt him for a decade after the war. And just as a side note, General Groves thought this fabrication was actually contrived to protect his brother Frank. The belief was that Frank might have been one of those parties who offered to get information. We don't have any proof of that, but that's what General Groves thought. Now, none of this might have mattered were it not for two significant developments in the 1950s. The first, which Oppenheimer had no control over, was a nation gripped by a wave of anti-communist, anti-Soviet sentiment. And there were legitimate reasons to be concerned, of course. The Russians unexpectedly detonated their first atomic bomb in August 1947. A year later, Americans learned that Klaus Fuchs, a British scientist who had worked here at Los Alamos during the war, had repeatedly given secret weapons data to the Soviets. And in March in 1951, Juli Americans Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were convicted and subsequently executed for passing atomic secrets to an agent of the Soviet Union. Capitalizing on this fear, for example, Senator Joseph McCarthy launched widely publicized hearings on suspected Russian penetration of government agencies, such as the State Department and the U.S. Army. It was a lethal atmosphere for anybody who appeared to buck the system. The second development was Oppenheimer's antagonistic and ultimately disastrous relationship with Louis Strauss, the AEC's powerful second chairman. Strauss, a businessman and philanthropist, became the commission's most vocal champion for development of larger nuclear weapons, including the H-bomb, and a fierce opponent of sharing any weapons information, or any nuclear information, in fact, with other countries. The two men were very different in personality and temperament. And unfortunately, Oppenheimer, who could be this extraordinary, charming individual, did not court straws. He did not try to smooth their interactions. In fact, there were occasions where Oppie appeared to deliberately either offend or humiliate straws. And there is one episode that exemplifies not just the philosophical differences between these two men, but Oppenheimer's capacity for insensitivity. In late 1949, Congress took up the possibility of making radioactive isotopes available for research, for example, in health, and not just making them available to American institutions, but foreign institutions. Louis Strauss vehemently opposed such a program. He thought it was beyond dangerous, and he made his emotional feelings very plain in congressional hearing. Oppenheimer and others disagreed, however. And Oppenheimer testified to this at the same congressional hearing. He followed Strauss, asked about isotopes and their role in national defense. He replied, playing to the audience, quote, my own rating of the importance of isotopes in this broad sense, national security, is that they are far less important than electronic devices, but more important than vitamins, somewhere in between, unquote. Now, members of the committee laughed. Oppenheimer no doubt believed his testimony had gone well. But Louis Strauss had stayed in the congressional hearing room, in the back of the room. He had heard every word. His face was red and he was, his fists were clasped in anger. Now, was Oppenheimer's behavior deliberate or was he just insensitive? Was he playing the actor? Was he grandstanding? It didn't matter. Straws never forgot the incident, nor would he ever forgive it. The two men continued to clash, largely at this point over Straws' conviction that Oppenheimer repeatedly urged restraint in developing the super despite the worsening international situation. For Straws, this was tantamount to acting contrary to America's interest. Oppenheimer's opposition effectively dissolved, however, with the Soviet Union's first atomic bomb detonation in 1949. This made no difference to Louis Strauss, who had grown to detest Oppenheimer and was determined to remove him from any role in the government. And his opportunity came for revenge came in 1954, just months 
before Oppenheimer's security clearance was due to expire. It needed to be renewed. The Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer requested an extension, but was then informed that his clearance would not be renewed. As justification, and I'm simplifying a complicated story, he was presented with a long list of charges that included his political activities in the 1930s, his relationship with a former girlfriend, with Hank on Chevalier and other suspected communists, as well as breaches of security during World War II, and most importantly, his efforts faithful to stall or kill development of the super. Oppenheimer was permitted to appeal the decision, which as a matter of honor he chose to do. That triggered the hearing within the AEC. And although technically an administrative hearing, in other words, not a criminal trial, it was nonetheless conducted as a criminal trial with a seasoned prosecuting attorney named Roger Robb, who represented the commission. So years of secret investigations by the Army and the FBI, many with dubious or unsubstantiated charges, were presented to the judges along with transcripts collected illegally of Oppenheimer's interviews and phone calls recorded over the years. The three judges were given classified information not shared with the defense team. The board's eventual decision was never really in doubt. The three-member panel of judges voted two to one to deny renewal. Breaches of security, suspicious friends, intemperate remarks and comments aside, the heart of the hearing were Oppenheimer's actions in his role as advisor to the AEC and expert witness before Congress. While he never directly opposed the H-bomb, he did question if such a super bomb was necessary. Instead, he advocated a progression, at least this is in the 40s and early 50s, of more powerful tactical weapons. He also questioned if the development of the H-bomb merited an emergency all-out program similar to the Manhattan Project, particularly when there was no clear technical path to building the thermonuclear. Now that changed in 1951 with the Ulam Teller breakthrough that even Oppenheimer was forced to admit it was technically sweet. But by filing an appeal, Oppenheimer had to know that any administrative hearing favored the AEC. It's just like if you don't file suit but with your credit card, you go into arbitration. The larger the company, the more that favors. They simply have the means to, to contest. Even his choice of attorneys favored the commission. Lloyd Garrison was a friend and a successful Wall Street attorney, but he had no experience as a defense attorney. Moreover, Garrison was not given access to classified information that might have helped his client's case. And on top of all of that, Oppenheimer appeared to simply melt down during the course of the hearing. At one point, about two-thirds of the way through, he was asked by Roger the Wobb, why did you do that, Dr. Oppenheimer? And he just wistfully said, because I was a fool. A few observers have suggested that in some dark psychological way, Oppenheimer wanted to be found guilty as a way of expiating his sins. I don't think that's the, it's something that we'll ever know. But we should ask if Oppenheimer genuinely, perhaps naively, believed he would be treated fairly and honorably. Did he think his past was behind him, that his history of flaunting security and deliberately misrepresenting an event would not reemerge as major offenses, however minor there were? Did he believe he could successfully confront the power and the might of the federal government and still prevail? Did he anticipate that the hearing would consist of brutal and humiliating interrogations, revealing personal information such as an extramarital affair? But even if he had known, would he have acted differently? We'll never know. In retrospect, it's easy for us to say that it would have been wiser to simply let his clearance expire. He would have gone back to the Institute of Advanced Studies, you know, sort of with his reputation intact. Oppenheimer chose otherwise, and his hearing is now as important to his popular biography, as was his extraordinary management of Los Alamos during the war. Oppenheimer withdrew from public view after the hearing. The AEC decision was appealed, the appeal was rejected. 
He refused a second appeal to President Oppenheimer and further rejected any notion of a public campaign for vindication. To his surprise, friends, colleagues, even people he had never met, sent money to help pay his legal fees. He retreated to the Institute of Advanced Studies at Princeton, where he served as director until 1966, and he died on February the 18th, 1967. At a memorial service for him, there were many old friends and colleagues, many from Los Alamos days. Among them was General Leslie Goes. Louis Strauss did not attend. So, is Robert Oppenheimer a legend, and what is his legacy? A legend, as you know, is a story that comes down to us from the past, typically about an individual, King Arthur. Typically, it's claimed to be history, or based on history, but in the case of legends, the truth doesn't often matter. For me, Robinheimer, the legend, is the combination of the penitent and victim hero I've discussed. It's the man fashioned by news and media. This simplistic portrait that we've seen year after year is still around, despite the fact that we know that his life was far more complicated than that which is portrayed. We understand that he was often the author of his own difficulties. That, despite his brilliance and erudition, he could be naive, he could be dismissive, arrogant, or condescending, and he could be contradictory. He played a major role in creating the atomic weapons, but then regretted their use in Japan. He planned to control um, their future development, but failed to understand that scientists had lost control of their creation the moment Fat Man and Little Boy left Los Alamos for Tinian Island in the Pacific. By the way, we have some historians here who disagree with that. Whether sincere or not, and I think he was sincere, Oppenheimer regretted his role in developing the new weapon, and yet we cannot ignore the energy and, yes, the enthusiasm that the man brought to his job as director of Los Alamos during the war. The legend has him recognizing his sin of making the bomb, but redeeming himself and becoming the hero by urging the restraint in the pursuit of larger, more destructive weapons and promoting international arms control, however ineffective those arguments were. His reluctance, not refusal, to support an all-out thermonuclear program inevitably raised concerns over his loyalty and concluded with a politically driven hearing that deeply wounded him. He was never the same after 1954. With time, Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb, would be replaced by the scientist with a conscience who paid a price for the courage of his convictions. My prediction is that the Oppenheimer legend will survive for some time, but will simplify. And let me tell you what I mean for this. His friendships and political activities of the 1930s are barely mentioned today. They simply don't matter anymore. The charges of disloyalty, exaggerated even at the time, seem patently contrived today. Even the questionable morality of working on a weapon of mass destruction will move off the front page because it was after all, and most people recognize this, it was developed with the purpose of ending a terrible war. His guilt as a component of his life story will be less and less important. So let me tell you what I think, how they will describe the legend, the Oppenheimer legend, in 50 years. The legend is this. Oppenheimer is the man who brought a new kind of fire to the earth, but to dismay found that it caused suffering. When he realized what he had done, he sought to take back the fire, but it was too late. Other men had come to claim it, and when he fought them for it, he lost, and they punished him, and they exiled him. That will be the legend. In the long run, Oppenheimer's legacy is far more important and inevitably more enduring than the, uh, than, than the real meaning, well, sorry. His legacy combines the real meaning of the word, that is, something tangible left by someone to another person or another generation. Ask what Robert Ammenheimer left future generations that transcend his personal triumphs and tragedy. The answer is an organizational model 
capable of conducting what we have come to call big science. I don't think Oppenheimer intended it, but the laboratory he helped create in fits and starts during the war, the model, as it were, was remarkably successful despite its flaws, and it is still viable today. Oppenheimer had his failures as a director, but his successes were greater, and they were the result of an imaginative and frankly lucky combination of such things as a fluid management structure, the use of groups and committees, task forces, a comfort with risk taking, a talented multidisciplinary workshop, workforce, and of course, you know, significant funding. And I have no doubt there were moments when Oppenheimer was simply flying by the seat of his pants. This model, this kind of structure is familiar today but it did not exist 75 years ago. I have to remember that before the war, most science was conducted on a small scale, typically in university settings. There were exceptions, of course, like Ernest Lawrence cyclotrons in California. But Salamis changed the paradigm. What started on this mesa contributed a quarter century later to putting Americans on the moon. Oppenheimer's laboratory continues today, now larger and more sophisticated, and similar organizations, but with different interests, operate all over the world. Will this institution continue to evolve? Of course, but it will always carry Robert Oppenheimer's imprint. His legacy is not just a name on the building, but it's a spirit that inhabits every room and every hallway. And it occurs to me tonight the living expression of Oppenheimer's legacy resides in the J. Robert Oppenheimer Memorial Society itself, specifically with its program of academic scholarships for young men and women. I have to believe that some of these recipients will study science or engineering or some new exciting and important field, and that some of these graduates will come back to work at Los Alamos. They will, they will become residents of the hill. And one of them, one of them will walk down Oppenheimer Drive, perhaps with a child in hand, and notice the street sign, and then bend down and tell his young companion, Oppenheimer once lived here, now we do. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. That was fantastic, and your voice held out to the end. Good. And I didn't take one sip. I'm very proud. So. so if anybody has questions now, I will bring this microphone out to you. Oh, I can change now. Are there questions? Raise your hand. I'll put it over here. Yes, I will. Yeah, you mentioned um, in the, the Batman and Little Boy movie that one of the inaccuracies was the, um, some of the scientists having misgivings as far as, as Operation Bomb. Was there anything during that period um, of while the bomb was being developed here at Los Alamos that, I guess, gave any kind of hint of that ever happening at all? You know, excellent question. He asked if there was any, during the war, if there was any sense of the use of the bombs and what they meant morally and so forth. You know, I've interviewed over the 40 years, maybe as many as 40, 30, well, 38 or 39, 40 alumni of, or alumnus of a laboratory during the war. Not one of them mentioned guilt. I do know, and I think we know from the record, that some knew reasonably into it that they were not going to work on weapons after the war. I think it's difficult to translate what the war meant for America. It was an unusual period, an unusual period of social consolidation. People really supported it. And the war was terrible. And one of the disagreements I have with my younger contemporaries, the so-called revisionists, is they now, with the, with the benefit of hindsight, they look back and so they find maybe a person who wrote a letter said, this is a nasty thing, and it's meant to generalize. 
I think the one thing that I did hear when I talked with people about the bomb, not trying to press them, but to give them a chance to say, is invariably the response was, we believe that if it was going to take something to end the war with Japan, if Japan was defeated, but it wouldn't surrender, then maybe this weapon would do it. And in the end, all they wanted to do was to have the war end and then for them to go home. Most of, the, as you know, there was a great departure of, of people from Los Alamos after the war. Nobody thought it was going to survive. So, I think where the where the the, the peace, you know, I think my more callous co colleagues call it the peaceniks, the Manhattan District peaceniks, that started at the University of Chicago. Leo Zillard was a big mover. It circulated a petition to not use the bomb, or if it had to be used, used as a demonstration. But it's simply, first of all, it defied logic that you would use it as a demonstration. Who would come and see it? How would they believe it? All endless questions. It was just a no-go. The other question is um, not using it. Um, and I think if you've read, I think many of you have read books on the subject. I, my own personal view, it wasn't up to Truman to say, yes, drop the bomb. His decision was to say no. The decision to use the weapon had been made as early as 1945, but by the spring, I mentioned that the target committee here at Los Alamos, it was in full swing, and they just assumed the bomb was going to be used if the opportunity presented itself. Does that answer? Thank you. You're letting me off easy. Are there any more questions? By the way, I want to say about Alan Carr, who, as you know, is a historian himself. He certainly justifies, I think it's a Greek saying that history never lies, but historians do. So <laughs> thank you for those glorious lies. About me. I have a less deep question, which is I'm wondering if there were scientific prototypes before Oppenheimer, like when you said that um, you know, he fit our model of, this, of the genius scientist, but I'm wondering if he created that model. Well, you know, that's, that's a very good point, too. I think, you know, again, I, I don't want Do you, to... Can you repeat the question? Oh, yes. Well, I think she better repeat it because I'm not sure I can phrase it quite like... It. Say it one more time. Well, I won't repeat it the same way, I'm sure. <laughs> well, I, I said that um, I was wondering if there were other models of the genius scientist when you said something like he... He fit our prototype of what a genius scientist ah, was, and yes. really maybe he created that. For right. Us. Were there were there others besides Oppenheimer who sort of fulfill that model of either the guilty scientist or the, the victim hero? I think there have been some. Um, on the other hand, you do have the heroes. For example, we're talking today at lunch. The two gentlemen who invented um, for diabetes insulin. They deliberately chose not to, to, cop, I mean, to patent it. Instead, they made the formula available because that was their gift. So there you have the moral scientist who, act, who could have made millions out of their discovery but acted. In, in terms of the guilt, um, you know, Edward Teller never expressed any guilt. In fact, he only became more adamant that the order that he got about the weapon was necessary because if we didn't have the thermonuclear weapons, the Russians would get it and then it would be Armageddon. So I, offhand, I can't think, at least in the modern term. I'm sure in history, Galileo Galilei is a man who was made a martyr. He you know, talked about this ghastly notion of the sun, you know, the earth revolving around the sun except the other way and was basically you know, reduced to house arrest for the rest of his life. That's it? Ah, you're easy. Thank you, again. It's been a pleasure.